Hi, this is Jeff from Michigan Michael Chekhov Classes, and this is my third interview for Detroit Film and Theater Talk, or Theater and Film Talk, I can't remember which, but it's one of those things. And uh, today we're going to talk with my very dear friend, John Foreman, who I've known for several years, and we're gonna be talking about theater and Detroit theater and John Foreman and all your history and uh, the very wise man that John Foreman is. And uh, I'm yeah. really looking forward to having this conversation with me you. Too. Me too. Thanks so, for asking me. So, uh, John, what's up, man? Been uh, a lot. It's so good to see you, man. I'm so glad you came back mm -hmm. to Michigan. I, I missed you for six years. So, <laughs> uh, you remember, I was just thinking about this the other day. Um, it was this time in 2003, which is 16 years ago. No, that wasn't 16 yes, years ago. Yes, it was. Oh, I, I just saw the poster again the other day oh. that Jeff and I did a show at the wonderful Detroit Repertory Theater, and our co-star was the lovely Amir Makeupson. And mm -hmm. we had such a hoot. I mean, we, we had a great time. And Jeff was my son. And oh. I've always thought of you as my son. Oh, well, thank you. But, uh, thank you. And, You're and, the dad I never had. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was, it was uh, my introduction. I just moved here like the year before and mm -hmm. uh, came back here uh, after many, many, many years to help take care of my mother's, my uh, wife's mother after her father passed. And, that's what I never thought I'd be back in Detroit. That's for damn sure. Because <laughs> uh, I was born here, lived a couple of years, then all over the country, and came back on scholarship, and then left again. Um, but at any rate, it was it was fun doing that show. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a little crazy. <laughs> it was, I'd never. Well, I mean, when you're doing new work, it's always a little crazy. Absolutely. Right? Mm -hmm. Here's the difference, though. Mm -hmm. I did a lot of new theater in New York City, off-Broadway, mm -hmm. a lot, maybe eight shows. And I'm used to having the playwright around, yeah. working with the director, and trying things out and changing them and learning it that night to, to work in rehearsal the next day. And that playwright was known for her joke books. She was an essayist, yeah. 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 And mm -hmm. her husband was an essayist, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And... With all due respect to the great company, uh, Detroit Repertory Theater, they never rewrite ever, ever. They mm. don't. I don't. Mm -hmm. If they do it now, I'd be shocked. But mm -hmm. that really caught me off guard because my character had these speeches, and I tell the story <laughs> all the time that my character would come out. I was the ghost, uh, the husband of Amir. And several times I'd come out on a revolving turntable and give a little speech, you mm -hmm. know, and ha ha ha, I have a good time. Well, this writer, being an essayist, when you're reading a comic piece, there's always the premise, the setup in the first couple of lines, mm -hmm. tell you what we're, what we're going to be talking about. And then while you're reading, you can go off on other tangents, but if you forget, you can go back to the top of the paragraph and start again, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Then you get to the end of the line. Well, these speeches, there was one in particular where I'd say the setup at the very beginning and the birds were going by and yet have you, and I'd go off in another direction, and by the time I got to the punchline, it had been so long ago, nobody <laughs> knew what I was talking about, so I'd deliver the punchline. Dead. So oh, yeah. It so totally. it would have been helpful if that punchline was a little delivered closer a little the, closer to the setup. Yeah. And... and uh, whenever I, at a certain point, I came off the turntable, and I don't remember the woman's name, bless me, but uh, bless her, but uh, I go, I, I, I can't do it, I can't, it's not going to work, I can never, and I asked the director, please, can I cut out a few of these ancillary lines, please, no, we don't do that, we don't cut, we don't add, that's it, we're done. So it was a yeah, little bizarre Bruce, in that regard, yeah. but that's when I got to watch you, because I know you not been here very long before. Oh, no, I, I had uh, literally almost just arrived. Yeah. When, when you auditioned yeah. that higher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So after that, we didn't really get a chance to run into each other too much, but we kept in touch. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get a chance to ask my, my lady what, what Shakespeare show we saw of you in Waterworks in the park. Mm. What, what was that? What I don't know. I, mean, I was in a ton. Uh, I did Mackers. Um, I did uh, As You Like It. I did... I think it was As You Like It. Was, it, was yeah. I Jayquees in that? All the World's a Stage? Was yes, it? that's it. Okay, that's yeah. one. Mm -hmm. And you were delightful. 
No, oh, thanks. <laughs> great actor. Great actor. I'm glad he's teaching and all that, but he's a great actor. So after you, all of a sudden you took off, and mm -hmm. it was only through Facebook we were able to stay in touch, mm -hmm. and I watched your journey, and I was so pleased when you came back here. Really, the only, uh, not talking about theater and my experiences and stuff, um, I've, I've, I've always had an unusual category. They, n n a lot of people never knew where to put me. Yeah, well. You know, because when well, I was a, okay. a, a young man, I used to say mm -hmm. I was, you know, the young romantic lead. You know, mm -hmm. I was so pretty back in the day, you know. <laughs> and, but at a certain point, um, I wasn't getting the character because I always thought of myself as a character actor. Mm. Always did. Always did. And some of the most delightful shows I ever did is when I got to be comic or crazy or weird, mm. you know, and that was mm -hmm. that was great fun. But here in Detroit, I auditioned enough, but again, I was I was trying to start my acting program here too mm -hmm. and working to survive and make things happen. So I didn't I only did one other play here. And that was uh, 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 um, the Jewish, Jewish play at the Jewish, Jewish Ensemble Theater, um, Sisters Rosenzweig. And, and oh, yeah. I mm -hmm. had you know great fun out there and got to meet all those people and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I, I pulled back from theater as an actor. I did mm -hmm. because I was getting film and commercial and music video work like that. I mean, yeah. You know, Boom! It just was. Boom. Yeah, and now you're. Ever, I mean, you just did. You just had a premiere. Yeah, Sunday last Sunday night. Yeah, yeah. I saw those pictures on Facebook. They are really. <laughs> you look very uh, sharp. It's 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 Devil's Night, uh, the dawn of the Nain Rouge. Uh, filmed it two years ago, and they, it takes its time and its process. But uh, mm -hmm. we had the premiere finally, finally, finally Sunday night, and mm -hmm. it was great fun. And I, I, I'm very pleased with my work. Uh, I got wonderful compliments. It was just mm -hmm. delightful. And uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I have also got another film that I shot last year that I'm waiting will hopefully come out. Uh, Strain uh, 100. We all we'll call it the zombie movie because everybody and his brother was in this, as a zombie. Well, yeah. I, I had a a really great role. It was you were a non-zombie. Yeah, I, I was. I was a, a, a crazed survivalist. Is oh, the best way I can put yeah. it. Yeah, and a real twist, mm. real twist. So, uh, Hassan Hussein, would you get this movie done so we can, you know, oh, have Hassan, a premiere? Yeah, I think I, I I shot for Hassan many years ago too, mm -hmm. uh, and he's a great local filmmaker. Yeah, who does, doing some who wonderful work. Always trying to get his film up and going. Yeah. I think I shot for him down in Dearborn. I, this was way. This was maybe over a decade ago. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so I, I I'm, Haas and I had yeah. a great time, and and the, I, the, I can't say anything about uh -huh. what I did, but I, I sure had a great time uh -huh. working with the lead woman and and a little girl, and all kinds of stuff was happening in it. And the end of my uh -huh. character's uh, scene is I'm, I'm waiting for everybody to see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the problem. That's the thing about film, you know. It, it, it's 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 something where I mean, I did. Um, this show or this this film, um, oh gosh, I think it was it was probably 2005, um, just before I went to the Hillbury for grad school, mm. and um, it was called Dominic Blue at the time, and then they they renamed it uh, Detroit Rock City, right? And it had uh, the lead singer from the Verve Pipe in it, right? And I filmed it. I went through all of grad school. <laughs> I will. I went through an entire career here, and then I went down to Louisiana, and the director was like, oh, yeah, we finally got it released in Japan. <laughs> I was like, great. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I went to, just remember, I went to acting school after I did the movie. Yeah. Um, but it, it's, uh, it's interesting how little control we have over that and how we, we watch and we're like, that's, that's sometimes I did that years and years ago, and I changed so much since that was filmed yeah. physically emotionally mentally uh but you know talent wise i feel like i've grown as an actor and but you're watching this this capsule of you yeah that's true uh there there, there to that point mm -hmm. the the first uh hollywood film i ever did mm -hmm. i was still in atlanta but it was 
probably six, seven years before the incentives kicked in and it became the capital of the world. But um, I got cast out of Atlanta with the, uh, the big agency there for a film that we shot over in, in, in Birmingham, Alabama. And mm -hmm. I got to work opposite Billy Crudup and Julianne Moore. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and I just had a couple of lines. I was a, 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 a guy hanging at the bar mm -hmm. in Dakota, in one of the Dakotas. And mm -hmm. um, that was the first time I'd been around you know, any of that kind of level of work. And her husband, Bart Freundlich, who's still, it just came up with another movie, was directing it, wrote it. And it, it's, it turns out to be a delightful film. World, mm -hmm. World Traveler is the name of it. And, oh, okay. And, you know, I, I still get a residual check, believe me. <laughs> oh, yeah? How much, how much is oh, it? Oh, it's big. About, what, a buck and a half every <laughs> a six half, months? Hey, yeah, yeah. It's I great. can buy that newspaper I've been saving up for. I tell you. I tell you. <laughs> and, and so that, that was my exposure. I said, this, this is fun. I like this. So uh -huh. come in. And... It, 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 we'll be jumping between theater and film uh, all over in this conversation, but one of the things, uh, there, there are a couple of things that have happened since I came here, which I was so excited about. Um, the, the, the film incentives were, were really great fun for all of us when it was in place for that two or three years. Mm -hmm. and there was so much activity, and you, we were off camera, we were talking about uh, uh, how the locations here are so incredible incredibly beautiful and wonderful. You can, and diverse. And diverse. You can go mm -hmm. over to the uh, west side of the state and you're in the sand dunes and you think you're in the Sahara Desert. I mean, mm -hmm. it's that kind of stuff, you mm -hmm. know? Well, I, I lived in Georgia for 11 years. I, uh, Michigan beats Georgia for scenery by, by a mile. They mm -hmm. really do. Mm -hmm. I mean, Georgia's beautiful in certain places, but I'm sorry. If you're out there in 100 degree heat and it's humid and you're shooting, you are exhausted. All power to those people who've had to work down there in those kind of conditions, because yeah. it's 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 hot. Mm -hmm. So we're having lived in Louisiana. I'm yeah, really familiar yeah. with what you that does the same thing. to you. It sucks your life thing. out of you. And mm -hmm. so consequently, when the incentives and it was all political and it was such a mess and everybody was upset about them going away, but at the same time, we still had young filmmakers, a very wonderful creative community who are doing all kinds of experimental work. Mm -hmm. Well, I got cast my first really fun, big thing in 2008. Uh, I auditioned and got cast for the opening speaking role in an Eminem music video called When I'm Gone. Oh. And it, it was really killer, and they, the, the agent called me on Friday and said, we're shooting Monday, can you do it? I said, well, I'm a little sick, but I, well, I don't know. Called me back on Sunday and said, "You got to do this, John. You got to do it." Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I drove up there, and it was a, a, a chaotic music company production. It wasn't mm -hmm. a Detroit production. It was out of New York for a music company, and you know they they spend zillions of dollars and throw it away. But the fun part was that I got to stand at the podium and it's at a self help meeting, and I'm finishing telling my story mm -hmm. and then Eminem gets up and he's from here to the camera away mm -hmm. and which he, isn't very far which isn't very far Three, the camera four, is very close feet. and I can look right up at him in the eye line and I'm in the front row after I'd done my thing mm -hmm. and he went through that song three times non-stop no breaks intensity and total commitment to what he was doing mm. and I'm looking at him and you know when you're opposite an actor and they're into it and you're into it you're in another world yeah it's a wonderful feeling that's what I got from him not that he was doing it to me but I was looking at him mm -hmm. so this guy's really well, there's a reason yeah. he's a superstar right I mean, I'm sorry yeah there's, there's, totally yeah. well and it turns out that this particular music video well I know it, the end of the story it turns out to be a great music video uh, about mm -hmm. him wanting to break the Slim Shady character. That's what it's about, because he wants to be home with his daughter. Mm -hmm. And it's, when I'm gone, when I'm gone, here's what happens. So I'm not going to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. So two weeks later, I called the agency on a Monday. I, it was after Thanksgiving. And I said, hey, that was you know, really fun. What, what are they going to do with it? Well, John, it's premiering tonight at 5 o'clock on Total Request Live, the old MTV music show. I went, 
Really? Yeah, <laughs> cool. So I called my buddies. Wait, and how, long, came over. how long was it between the time you filmed to the time it premiered? About two weeks. Wow, that's literally. a really quick. Took turnover. me six months yeah. to get paid <laughs> Well, because there was a big dispute between the record company and the film company. Oh. So yeah. I got these guys over, and on TRL, they used to say, hey, the world premiere of a new video. They do that all the time. Mm. They just build it up and build it up. And I'm sitting there, and my buddies are around me and going, okay, cool, okay, come on. Well, and here it is, Eminem's When I'm Gone, there's my face in a close-up, right there. <laughs> That's exciting. <laughs> it was, yeah. I'm going, what? And I mm -hmm. did my speech and did my thing, and, you know, I'm over. And then the rest of the video came on, and it was incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. So that was fun. That was mm. fun. Jump cut to 2013, 20, yeah, 2014, and I auditioned for another music video, uh, for a couple of French brothers who had moved here because of the incentives, but stayed anyway. Mm -hmm. And they had already had several huge music video hits out, in, out of France. And they got hired by Insane Clown Posse okay. to do a video. And so I went in and auditioned, and I'd already put on camera, came in and met them, and they had me do this move and these emotions and what have you. I get a call the next day, I'm hired. Well, Insane Clown Posse, I knew very little about except some of the controversies, but the Decca Brothers, that's what they're called, D-E-K-A, mm -hmm. they wrote this incredible script for this for this music video, and I play a bishop in, in a des deserted, collapsed world walking his group <coughs> through them and carrying a box to bring to the god or whoever it is mm -hmm. and this little boy and it was my first first death scene i'd never done a death scene and my first one was on camera and so you'd never done a death scene at all never not, done not even in scene. theater or no, anything no no wow. and you know that's one of the actor's great goals i gotta do a death scene yeah I've, got, I've been in far too many death scenes <laughs> people love to kill me on, on camera and on film and, yeah. and, and, and on stage they love to kill me they yeah, love to see me yeah. die well i've been in a lot of dead shows that's for sure <laughs> not, not dying also. but so I'm, I'm i'm leading up to a, a mm -hmm. really wonderful part of my career here in detroit it has just mm -hmm. been great uh a couple of months after we shot it i got called in again mm -hmm. they got another music video only this time it's for skrillex now, I didn't know Skrillex from Adam. I haven't mm -hmm. been paying attention to the music industry, but it was for Skrillex, and got cast again. Only this time it was another French director who had won, just won a hell of a lot of awards for his music, for directing music mm. and stuff. And this one was Skrillex with Damien Marley doing and singing, the son of Bob Marley, and it's called Oh, the first first one with Skrillet with ICP was uh, Chris Benoit, and this one is called Make It Bundem. It's a Jamaican term for, you know, burn the cops. That's the idea, mm. right? And the story, basically, I'm playing a Wayne County sheriff who is throwing people out of their homes because he's working with a developer to get a piece of the action. Mm -hmm. And... So we're, uh, they're throwing people out, and I'm instructing them, and you see me do this, and all this stuff is going on in the music. Excuse me. And then one of the people that we throw out is an Indian, excuse me, an old Indian, American Indian, Native American. i got to get into that habit. I, mm -hmm. I don't like saying Indian anymore. Uh, and, his, and his son. We were throwing them out. Well, they put the bougie bougie on him, and the rain starts falling, all this other activity starts happening. Mm. There, it, it, the kid, he put the father puts war paint on his face, and the kid puts on feathers. He goes in the backyard and does a, a Native American dance, mm -hmm. and brings the demons. And this incredible dragon in fire comes out of his chest, and it comes and gets me. And it's a mm. killer video. <laughs> it's wow. really good. Yeah. And. So out of that, we had such a good time together. The Deca, Ben and Julian, uh, came good buddies and uh, a wonderful producer, Michael Manasseri, was involved in their productions and that's what they're doing. Leading up to Christmas of, of 2014, I get a call. No, I'm sorry. It's Christmas, I got an email from the boys in France. Mm -hmm. John, we've written a script 
with you in mind, and we'd really like you to read it and think about doing it. And I wow. Said, Somebody wrote a script for me. No, I'm not going to do That's that. That's got to feel good, right? No, it was. I was. Uh, I was overwhelmed. Mm-hmm. And then to read the script, it was killer. It was a great script. The dialogue mm-hmm. just flowed off this. Mm-hmm. For, they had an English guy working with them in their translation, but it was, it was their first American film that they'd ever done. And it's called Father and Son, and I play a demon who has been thrown out by the devil and he wants to get back to to the devil mm-hmm. and he has a half human half demon son to help him so the two of them are going around scamming people so that he can please the devil to bring him back and that's the basic premise of the film okay and great kid uh, was my son and I'm, I'm I'm sorry I'm blanking on his name right now I'll think of it but it was just wonderful, and I was I had such you know respect for what they did, and we were, we were talking a bit about the distribution system and doing films as young filmmakers and what have you, and this really surprised the hell out of me. We finished it, and the fall of uh, in 2015, it was shown at the Hollywood short film festival which has been around for 100 years a mm-hmm. wonderful festival and we won best film that's great that was like two months out of the box first festival mm-hmm. played at right and 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 oh guys i'm sorry the kid won best supporting actor so i'm going man this is going to take off it's going to be great the problem was Mm-mm. it was 39 minutes long okay filmmakers keep in mind well they had a distributor in LA, other places, and they had a website with private address so that people could, could look at it and the screeners could do all that, right? Nobody picked it up. Why? It was 39 minutes long. It had to be 22 minutes or less, or it had to be 90 minutes. You couldn't, they had nothing yeah, like, in their categories for a programming to do 39 minutes. So sort of this prepubescent kind of, or adolescent movie that is not not a baby movie it's not no, a little it's, baby it's movie pretty, it's, it's not a, violent it's, it's not pretty, an adult movie yeah it's, it's close to it's, it it's, it's <laughs> like it's like well i mean like what i'm saying it was is, strictly the time it's just Jeff. yeah it's, it it's that middle category that it's hard to hard to place well it it, it, mm-hmm. it we could have fit it was called a supernatural thriller that's mm-hmm. the category we fit in mm-hmm. okay the problem was it was 39 minutes long they can put four 10 minute movies into that slot instead of one 39 minute movie that was the thing and it's hard to put that on like a compilation it is and 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 Mm -hmm. that was so frustrating and and you know the whole festival market is is, has been played and it's a game now you have to pay to enter you have to pay to go fly yourself out there if you're in consideration it used to be a very honorable thing where you know yeah it, it was it was really well respected but now there's a festival every 10 minutes and a great way for people to make money because mm. the filmmakers pay to submit. And that doesn't mean they're going to even get shown. They just submit the damn thing. Now, mm-hmm. my opinion, but we did not play any other festival in America at mm. all. We won. We played over in France at a, at a, a horror genre kind of festival. Won best film there, but nowhere else, man. And after six, seven months, I'm saying, what's going on? And that, that's when they told me the story. They, they get rejected by every single festival because it was 39 minutes long. Mm. And I'll, I'll bring you the DVD, the Blu-ray, and let you look at it. It's, it's a great film. It, yeah. In spite of my work, I don't, I don't care. But. So then, guess what? Last year, at the end of the year, the script was so tight it was hard to cut anything. I couldn't see where they could reduce it. it really, yeah, the only, the only thing to do is to fill it out. Expand it. And we were hoping to do that, but mm. you know, at a certain point it had to get done because the kid was getting older. You know, and mm-hmm. That's the way it goes. But anyway, it, it was so tight. I get a note at the end of the year that they've actually cut it. Now from 39 minutes to 17 minutes. They cut 22 minutes out of this thing. Wow. I couldn't believe it. And they changed the title. It's called My Blood, and it's re-released. 
and it's already won a couple of awards. Oh, good. And, and the DP, Jeff George, just got chosen as one of the top ten emerging cinematographers in the International Cinematographers Guild. <clears throat> it is now played in L.A., New York, Chicago, Atlanta, Poland, England, Germany, because it's one of ten films that got chosen for these cinematographers. So I've had more people in the last six months see my film than they did in the last five years. Well, yeah, and that's something you filmed uh, five years ago, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it's interesting how we're, we're kind of, uh, you know, actors are, uh, you know, any kind of artist. We're all, we're all uh, servants to these objective rules placed by others. It has to be in a certain length. It has to be a certain type. It has to fit into a certain category. You have to sit, fit into yeah. a certain category. And it's hard to say, you know, look, maybe I don't fit into any category. Yeah. Maybe this doesn't fit into any category. It's hard to be innovative as a result of that too, don't you think? Very true. No, the, and, and we've been griping about commercialism in the work for, for 100 years, but mm. um, especially now that there's so many platforms where, where things can show, mm -hmm. trying to get yours out there so people can see it is really, really hard nowadays. I mean, I hear about mm -hmm. stuff on uh, Acorn or Ego TV or whatever these things may be. So he says, hey, you gotta see this. Well, there's so much content. How can anybody keep up with any of it? Yeah, we, we, we're definitely in an interesting time, you know, because I think yes. it's, it's great that, I mean, this this is going to be put right up on YouTube. That's right, it'll There's be no, here for the next yeah, hundred years. I, yeah, I don't have to. I don't have to worry about dealing with a distributor. I don't have to. You know, I, I don't have to spend any money really no. to to no. put it up. At the same time, how do you get people to watch it? How do you get people to come? <laughs> You know, you know, subscribe, please, to, to your videos. Yes. You know, and and what uh, channel is this called? <laughs> this Michigan is film and theater. Uh, video, well, this is uh, this is on my Michigan Checkoff channel. Ah, okay. So okay. that's uh, Michigan Checkoff, which is with two H's, C H E K H O V, uh, Michigan Checkoff channel. But um, and if you just go in the search bar and put Michigan Checkoff, well, if you'll you're find watching my, it, you know where it is. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> or or else it's uh, you see it, you're seeing it on YouTube. Or on Facebook. But, um, you know, it, it's great that there's so many avenues, not, not just on YouTube, but there's uh, Vimeo and there's, um, you know, online, uh, other online video sources. And then there's TV, Acorn, you're saying, um, Hulu. Netflix, Hulu, oh, Disney. Plus. I mean, it, it's, it's a really awesome time that we're living in. But again, we're, we're being inundated. You know, we all wanted more choice. No, and, and that's true. And America's like, you want more choice? Here's some got more it. choice. <laughs> I dare you to try and find this. Yeah. Well, you got choice. Yeah. Uh, and it, that that is absolutely right, Jeff. Yeah. And that yeah. that with all of this, that there is a, 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 a very ironic mm -hmm. twist to the whole distribution and structure of this stuff. I remember first reading about this a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Everybody was dying for content. That's the magic word. Mm -hmm. I got to have content on my Acorn channel. I got to mm -hmm. have content for Which Netflix. is still an issue, don't you think? It is yeah. still an issue. Yeah. And, but the real problem begins, especially because things started streaming and showing up on the web, it took SAG a little while to catch up because the pay scales for all that stuff dropped dramatically. Instead of getting a standard SAG day rate of five hundred dollars a day, you'd get two twenty, two thirty, because that's what they were paying. You're working period. harder and working just as much as you were getting. Yeah. So, it's become a. And I remember reading that SAG article about that. It was really discouraging because yeah, it's great. There's all these platforms out here, mm -hmm. but you're not getting paid anything, and there's no residuals. It mm -hmm. just keeps showing on the web all the time. Mm -hmm. Where's Where's my cut of this? And because the music industry went through the same issue, it was even worse for the music industry because nobody a, was getting paid. Yeah, it's a, it, it, we're definitely in a period of transition as we, you know, try to get a hold of, you know, the fact that I mean, I, I personally love the fact that it's so easy to make a movie now. You know, it's so it, absolutely. I mean, the, the the software. I mean, you can get pretty good software for practically nothing yeah. online that that helps you put together anything that you filmed on your cell phone and if you have a compelling story and you do it in a, an interesting way i mean 
you can really make some really exciting things. That's right. And I think that's great because in the old days, what? You needed to cart in like a, a two-ton you know, uh, operation with cameras and, and boom mics and everything else. Well, I, 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 I did another film last year, year, year before last, rather, uh, played all through last year that I was cast in uh, called the They Scream in Silence. Mm -hmm. And young filmmaker, trained a little bit at, at Motion Picture Institute, MPI, mm -hmm. and came from India a while ago. Mm -hmm. And the kid, Ashray Dravidian, very, very talented kid, wrote this wonderful script about the, a Holocaust survivor who makes an incredible discovery. And when I, he contacted me, he wanted me to do it, and I read the script again. Beautiful material, gorgeous story, really knock your socks off as a tribute to the Holocaust survivors. How he just came mm -hmm. up with this, an Indian kid came in and wrote this, I never really understood. But it was very poetic and very wonderful. And he did this, and it was a small budget. It wasn't big, but it was kind of an on, a, a, a labor of love for all of us in that regard because it was such a beautiful story. Mm -hmm. And it, too, has won a basket of awards. Mm -hmm. But who's going to pick it up and distribute it? Where is it going to go for 17 minutes mm -hmm. and let people watch it? Yeah. And it's called They Scream in Silence, and uh, he has not made any kind of deals with any kind of platforms. And mm -hmm. where do you have a... Remember there used to be anthology shows where they show four or five different stories in an hour? You yeah. Know? And this sure. is this is, it was always great. I hear of none of that. I suppose it might be somewhere, but I can't find it. Yeah, I think I recall seeing, like, Netflix sometimes has, like, a compilation. Yeah, well, of, there, and there's a, a, a short TV, a short film channel of some yeah. kind. Yeah. But that, again, is the same problem we're up against, where this marvelous little film, and I, I was honored to play this role, and really well done, and who's going to see it? other than what they did at the festivals and you know yeah. how do you get it out there that's where the problem comes in with so many platforms and so much content well you know i i always think that you know every solution brings with it a problem so so we're gonna have yeah. we're, we we solved the problem of content right mm -hmm. or we're solving the problem of content but then we're creating the problem of distribution and then we might solve the problem of distribution and then have the problem with content again or with pay rates again or pay. with this. Yes. So yeah. Pay. Or, or, you know, not, I love the work, but I do like getting paid. <laughs> well, it, it the, does. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and that's, what, that, that's what's so great yeah. uh, about what you're doing here in Michigan because you are getting paid to do what it is that you are A, good at, and B is your uh, B is your passion. Well, thank, thank you. Yeah. And it, it, it is important to me. And with these young filmmakers that I've worked with, and there's there's four or five mm -hmm. others I could talk about, but we only got about five hours. So, <laughs> um, no, the, 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 there was there was one that I worked on and a, a number of years ago, and mm -hmm. it was great fun and wonderful company and, mm -hmm. and good kids. I mean, they really did a nice job. And at the rap party. I went up to the writer-director and I said, you know, here's one of the things, and this is for all you younger than me filmmakers out there, no matter your age. I.e. everyone. Yeah, <laughs> I'm <just> everybody. Kidding. <laughs> I'm, <just kidding. laughs> I'm getting older than dirt now, aren't I? But uh, no, and I, I told him, I said, look, the, the art is great. The writing, the, the thing, the ideas, the creativity, imagination, the production you did, you know, it, it was really, really fine, but there's one thing you gotta do, young filmmakers, Learn how to raise money, because mm. that's what it's about. That is really what it's about. you got to learn how to raise money so that you can fulfill your vision of what you wanted to do. I mean, we compromise all the time in the yeah. movies and in theater where you, you can't afford that. So what can we do otherwise? Great. That, that's creativity. Well I, well, I mean, and I don't feel like uh, that, that's a necessarily a new statement. I mean, no, if you're, I mean certainly uh, that's what all the filmmakers are doing in LA right yeah. now. They're trying to raise money. money. You know, even if they get the film greenlit, yeah. they're still trying to raise more money. Absolutely. And they're, 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 and they're, they're going they're, international, they're, 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 they're going to China, they're, they're looking for people that's to, right. to and, produce. And, and they have learned the technique that, 
what they famously mm -hmm. call the elevator pitch, mm -hmm. where you've got to be able to tell the story and then ride down from the 10th floor in that amount of time. That's all the time you got. Mm -hmm. And that is, a, is what filmmakers forget about, is that, no, you've got to be able to raise the money, A, to do what you want to do, your mm -hmm. vision, B, to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants, no, no distribu distribution company wants to hear, yeah, I did this film for $10,000. They'll mm -hmm. laugh at you. doesn't matter how good it looks at. You've mm -hmm. got to look like you're serious and start, you know, step by step by step raising. Short story. Mm -hmm. At the premiere the other night, met a couple that are in town from Canada, it's filmmakers, and got into a conversation about the work and what I was doing, what they were doing. And very early in the conversation, one of the th very first things he said was, well, we just did a $1.3 million short film for... So and I went, what? <laughs> Name, please. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Can we I did. We connected. Contact information. And I please. said, you're who I'm talking about. You're, you're, you're serious. Because when you say $1.2 million for a short film, you're serious. You're being real. Oh, I spent ten thousand dollars for a short film. Who cares? Who mm -hmm. cares? Because then, how are you going to do marketing? You do have to pay for marketing. It doesn't just magically happen because people mm -hmm. like it. So when I talk about raising money, this is what our goal should be. Another young filmmaker a couple of years ago said the same thing. He said, "Yeah, this was about a twenty-three thousand dollars show, and I, I, I knew if I had a, at least a hundred thousand, I could have done more." I'm going. That's what you got to learn. Yeah. Orson Welles classic case of all that. He was an incredible filmmaker, but he did not know how to raise money. He was terrible at it. Well, and you know, it's okay. You you can be a genius yeah. and and make your films, but you have to also be smart about bringing people on board who can do that the you work. Can trust. <laughs> yeah, that you can that you can trust, sure, but I mean, uh you you have to at least try to find somebody who can raise money for you and and i think a lot of and this goes with theater too absolutely it, right. is is uh you know so many um there's there's so many great theaters that start up you know in here in chicago uh, i was just talking about one theater that that i know i won't m name their names but they they uh they were really really popular in the 90s like they got all the awards they had a nice theater space they got they got good crowds but they didn't understand that it wasn't just about that it was about building on that to to build up your board to fundraise to find corporate sponsors to do to to parlay that into the long-term success of your theater that's right yeah. And and the same thing with uh, with film. You know, you you can be this great filmmaker. You can tell these amazing stories, but you need to be able to take that and understand that 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 you are in the business of show. Yeah, that's right. It's called show business. Yeah, and that 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 mm -hmm. I have said that story the same way, same mm -hmm. time, many many times over mm -hmm. the years about mm -hmm. the fact that when you're doing a small theater company, when you're starting a theater company, I did. One in New York it lasted mm -hmm. a couple of years, but it was tough. It was really tough to, to maintain a theater company. Yeah, to start to start one, start one and get it going. And I I, I say this while well, we're t leading into some other areas and philosophies and opinions about theater itself and mm -hmm. the business of the theater and what's happening in theater in Detroit. And I've always said, look, no, nobody sets. If you open a hardware store, you're not you you don't set out to keep your hardware store at a little corner location. You do have dreams at a certain point of expanding, maybe having another location, doing a mm -hmm. bigger store. Whatever the retail business may be, I always use hardware stores, but the idea is nobody sets out to stay right in that corner. They mm -hmm. do have dreams. Well, the same thing with the small theater companies. Now, I'm, I'm old enough that I've, I've been through all of the changes and I've been equity for, God, 40 plus years. I've seen all the changes in the American theater that have taken place, and mm -hmm. it, it on one regard, it's really, really great. It's really fun. But for me, and this is my opinion, and I've experienced it, the darn small professional theater contract is killing equity and is killing American theater. Mm, Here's my point. Mm -hmm. That there was a company in Atlanta well before the thing, but it was before the uh, Olympics in 96. Mm -hmm. Very, very well-known theater company there. 
And they had European funding. They used to call them a European think tank theater. That's what they did. <laughs> but they got major funding, and it didn't matter if they sold a ticket. They paid for the entire show with the money they raised, mm -hmm. period. And that's great. It was great. You know what happened when it came around to the Olympics? The Olympics didn't put them in the cultural Olympiad because they didn't have any ticket sales. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> came to see the darn thing. Yeah. So it was a real eye-opener to me that these people are raising money to pay themselves and keeping themselves going, but they're not doing things that people would actually watch. And the same mm -hmm. thing with the small professional theater contract. Now, over the years, I, I, I understand the idea of doing a theater in your living room with 25 seats and 50 seats. Mm -hmm. well, I, I understand that. It's very intimate, close, and there's an advantage to it. Mm -hmm. But if you're familiar with the skin of our teeth and read that play at any point, I saw that in a space not too much bigger than your living room. Okay. And the skin of our teeth has like 50 people in it. And there are two or three scenes where everybody's on stage. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't work. And so what happens is... All you're looking at is butts and backs. Yeah, that's all, it's all it is. Mm -hmm. And the understanding of you do a show, you find a space that fits your show. And if you mm -hmm. have a, a standing space, you should know your limitations on what you can do in that space. But the other problem comes that you're only doing 50, 75, 100, 125, 150 seats. Man, you got to charge 50 bucks a ticket to pay for it. At least. You know, and then... Companies will rely only on ticket sales to pay for the production, and that's the last thing you do. You rely on raising money. Again, mm. fundraising so you can pay for the show in advance before you sell a ticket. <laughs> and when yeah. you sell tickets, then you're making some money and you can pay more. But Generally, you're, you're, you know, from what I understand, uh, your, your theater's in pretty good shape if uh, tif if ticket sales only account for 25, 25 to 50 percent of your profit, that's right. if it's 50 percent of your profit, okay. I would I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. But if it's 25, you're sitting real pretty. If it's only 25 percent of your overall profits and and your overall budget, budget. right? Yeah. Um, but um, but a, but a lot of theaters, I uh, I know a lot of theaters that that's that's the majority of their mo their money. It's right. 75, 80 yeah. percent. Uh, and at, that, at maybe a hundred percent. Well, that's yeah. true, and that 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 those kind of numbers have been true in New York theater mm -hmm. and American theater overall. Uh, I'm talking about you know the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis or Actors and it's Theater hard, in Louisville. It's, but it is hard for a uh, uh, up and coming. That's why it's so hard for a theater to get started. It is. It's because a lot of people will only give money to a theater that has a proven track record of success. And, and in order to do that proven track record, you have to exist for at least five years yeah. before they even consider you for any kind of grants or loans or well, anything I, like that. I used and, to say that you got to put on a Broadway show so you can raise money to do a Broadway yeah, show. Yeah, you yeah. Know, yeah. It's like equity. You have yeah. to be in equity in order to get into equity, That's right? That's right. <laughs> and we have that thinking just ingrained in us. Uh, well, I was talking about the arts. SPT, that contract, mm -hmm. why it's so frustrating is mm -hmm. because the purpose of the contract originally was giving the small theaters a break where they could hire one equity actor at a, at a minimum wage and have all rest mm -hmm. non-equity. But the point was it was supposed to grow. It's supposed to be temporary. Yeah, and that it was supposed to be the people on the board and the th are supposed to raise the money to pay mm -hmm. for the show. And what happened is that they kept staying. In, equity never enforced that. They didn't force the growth. They didn't force the, uh, the, the idea that after three years you need to go a higher tier. Now, some people can say, well, yeah, well, they do that and they do grow. Yeah, but I'm sorry. I can't put in six days a week rehearsal and then four nights a week mm -hmm five nights a week doing the show for 220 bucks before taxes? How, how, really? How many theaters here just do SBT contracts? How many do SBT yeah, how right many now? Only do SBT. Oh, contracts. gosh. It, well, I, I don't have any hard figures. I really yeah. don't. I would I say that... The, the, it's probably 75% of the theaters do that. Yeah, that, mm -hmm. and they've, they've been around for years and years and years. Yeah. And, it's, and, and from their point of view, I get it, because, because each tier up is very expensive. Yeah, you know, you're you're talking about 
you know, the difference. You know, you'd, you'd think, oh, uh, well, now I'm going to go into this tier now. And you're thinking, oh, I'm going to only spend a couple hundred dollars more and be able to give my actors a raise. Well, it's not that way at all. It's like eight hundred dollars more yeah. Yeah. for the next tier. Up. Except for the fact, as you were mm -hmm. saying, mm -hmm. the donors, the grant givers, are expecting that you're going to grow, and that mm -hmm. you're going to be more popular, and you're going to put on great shows, and you're going to sell out, and everybody wants it to mm -hmm. get in there. That's when they'll give you the money to help cover those costs. Mm -hmm. But you know, look, it, 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 we've all been there where. We love this work. All we want to do is act. All we want to do is put on shows. All we want to do is make films. That's our passion. But it does have to get paid for. That's the Do problem. you think there's money here in Michigan for to support Are what, you? you're, what you're talking about? <laughs> Jeff, I have said since the day I came back here in 2002 and all through the recession, look, the car companies had a lot of trouble and the city of Detroit went bankrupt, but you know what? There's always been a shitload of money in this town. Mm -hmm. Always. Yeah. And I'll give you one example. Look at the riverfront that's happened in 15, 16 years. That wasn't, that wasn't the state giving that money. It wasn't the city of Detroit. It were private donations. And mm -hmm. that's a lot of money down there. Well, Oakland County is, is uh Still very, I mean, Absolutely. in spite of everything, it's very wealth. one That's of the right. wealthiest counties. Not only, in the yeah, it is, but mm -hmm. all through the entire Detroit area, there, mm -hmm. there are retired people we never heard of that, that are zillionaires. Mm -hmm. that have that, they live in West Bloomfield, they live in Downriver mm -hmm. Wyandotte or mm -hmm. Gros Seal. But I'm telling you, there's always been that money here, always. Why would they want to give to us? Why would they want to give money? Yeah, I mean, what, what if, you were say, if you were saying to a young filmmaker, hey, you know, you, you're at a party and a, a rich, you know, you, this, this very wealthy person comes out of the blue and starts talking to you. And you, you're like, I need to somehow get them Do interested. <laughs> right? right. So I have the elevator pitch, which is this is what my story is about. But they're going to they're going to also ask. So why should I give you? Why should I give you money? I give to a lot of charities. Mm -hmm. Why should I give? Do you have it? What's your answer? Well, it goes into that question of what what is good for the community. Mm -hmm. And that cultural arts and music and theater are what keep us sane and keep us mm -hmm. human. Mm -hmm. And that Detroit has had a history of great music, that's for damn sure. And it's a way of perpetuating and growing our kids because it's always about the kids, isn't it? We've got mm -hmm. to be able to have them exposed to this. And they need to want to stay. I mean, I'm, I'm going to cheat a little uh, yeah, bit. I'm going to give go. you some of the answers that That's I'm looking right. for, too. You know, uh, the arts, theater, film, local film, it makes our state more livable. Mm -hmm. That's right. you, you, people are less likely to move away if they live within a short distance from places that entertain them on a regular basis. Yeah. Or you they know? can make a living at. Or that they, you know, if they want to be an artist, that they can be a performing artist and still make a living. I mean... Detroit gets it when it comes to music. Yeah. Yeah. They get it. Oh, all we have. You know? Have. But, but, but okay. with performing arts, for some reason, it's sort of like this blind spot. It's yeah. like, well, well, but we can never support theater. Why don't you move to New York or L.A.? Yeah. And, you know, oh, are you going to move to New York or L.A.? Oh, I love theater. I'm gonna, I see Stratford every year. And I'm like, so you're willing to drive three and a half hours out. Or I go to... Or I go to uh, um, the the jam or um, you know the, the purple rose the, the, or you know, purple like rose that. are well purple rose is great you know at least they're local yeah. at least at least they employ local actors but when you, when, you know you I, oh I go all, see the, all the touring companies that come through here great did you know that there's a theater company that specializes in musicals uh, you know uh, right down the street from the purple rose you know basically just a couple miles out did you, did you know that there's there's uh, a really great like arty theater down down um, in uh, just south of Dearborn, I mean, did, did, in, in did you know there's yeah. a theater company in the Max Fisher Building that is one of the most popular uh, uh, theaters in the country, but not in Detroit? That has sent two shows to Broadway. Did yeah. you know that Detroit Public Theater? And I don't know these people. Yeah. I don't know where they came from. I haven't mm -hmm. read much, you know, how they do it, but they did it. Yeah, they're good friends of mine. And yeah. now, or at least a couple of them, they're right. doing what we need to have happen. Mm -hmm. We need to have these original shows come up, and mm -hmm. have substance to them, not mm -hmm. just a crowd pleaser. 
but then you don't hear about them. People aren't, not enough people are going out there. I mean, I, I understand they have a pretty good program with the, with the schools and education system mm -hmm. and stuff, and that's, that kind of symbiosis has to happen all the time. I mean, mm -hmm. it's well, always that's, about... Yeah, theater is uh, educational, and, and, uh, and, and, and exposing kids to, to theater is a great first step to yeah. get them to be theater yeah. goers later on. Well, I'll tell you a, a, another story, but when, after I'd moved here, mm -hmm. I went out in an afternoon, just go out to the golf course, can hook up with a party and play a round of golf. And I hooked up with these three guys, middle-aged guys, and you know they had their money. You could see it in their equipment. And we had a good laugh when we were going around. When I told them I was an actor and got involved in that, and a couple of them, at, almost at the same time, said, "Oh man, we love theater. You know, we go to New York twice a year. We don't go to Broadway. We go to Off Broadway. That's where all the really great work is." I said, "Really?" Mm -hmm. I said, "Man, do you?" How about around Detroit? He said, the problem, and now we're talking about mm -hmm. 2005, 6, 7, something like that, but it was true at the time, and I still see it happening. They said, we can't go to the Detroit theaters most of the time because they're doing the same damn plays over and over and over <laughs> They're doing again. the same plays, <laughs> in, <laughs> the exact same plays in different theaters. That's it. That's it, exactly. <laughs> They're and like, they what's said, your season? Well, we're going to be doing such and such show. We're doing The Odd Couple, let's say. Right. And, then, and then you go, okay, they're, they're doing The Odd Couple. And then you go, uh, you know, to another theater. What, what's your season? We're doing The Odd Couple. And you're like, wow, how? Did, that happened did you guys talk? That just re recently. Uh, with Waterworks, we, we would have that issue. And, and it's hard, you know, it is difficult yeah. to, to, to talk with the other theaters and say, hey, what, what do you, right. I mean, you, but there are 38 plays to choose from yeah. for Shakespeare <laughs> and, and uh, actually 39. But, but and, what's going to drop crowd? Yeah, gonna but, crowd and, and it's like, well, everybody's doing this play. And it, sometimes it's just in the zeitgeist, right? And there's nothing you can do about right. it. Like, as you like, it tends to be done in clusters. And then it's not done for about seven years, and then everybody does it, and then nobody does it. Yeah, and, and mm -hmm. when I was a kid here, mm -hmm. community theater was extremely popular. It was the days when the Fisher Theater was the origination point for many, many, many up, uh, Broadway shows, Fiddler mm -hmm. on the Roof, and mm -hmm. I mean, a whole bunch of them. That all uh, dissolved. And what these guys were saying to me was, we love new work. We want to see new work. Mm -hmm. That's why we go off Broadway, because we can see stuff we've never seen before. And when I came back in 2002, there's still a hell of a great theater crowd. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people still go to the theater here. There's mm -hmm. community theaters. Horse Head still was still strong. alive when you came back. That's right. And so consequently, I looked. That's why our working at, at Detroit Repertory Theater back in the day, it was a new play. Never been done before. Yeah, that's, that's what we do. Mm -hmm. And... I encourage, there are a few now that are, you know, focusing more on new works, a few more, but mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it, at this point, it, uh, look, there, there's a company downriver in Trenton called the Open Book Theater. I haven't been there, but they've gotten tremendous reviews. They're yeah. doing what would traditionally be called obscure work, but, but they're doing... But they're not hiring equity yeah. either. Yeah. So, I mean, exactly. Yeah, yeah, they're not. And so they're not, I'm hoping they're building, and I'm mm -hmm. hoping that they're, they're going to move grow. out of the strip mall store, a uh, 50 seat theater mm -hmm. at some point. Mm -hmm. But again, it's, it's hit, hit or miss. But mm -hmm. I tell you, it's like when we're doing movies, nobody's ever done this movie before, most of the time, right? Mm -hmm. Rarely see, well, remakes, let's not get into that. But um, you're originating a role. You're originating a character that's never nobody's ever seen before, mm -hmm. and that's what is the most exciting part of acting is doing stuff nobody's created. There's a young woman that studied with me quite a while, and she's now working all over town. Most of it is new works, and she's having a ball, having a great time mm -hmm. doing the new works. Mm -hmm. So that's what I want to see, and I, I I come from that generation of theater. Mm -hmm. That was rebellious. That absolutely pissed people off and got people excited and really wild and crazy. Mm -hmm. None of you are probably old enough to be around when Hair first came out, but Hair shook this country up, big time. Mm -hmm. Hair was a musical that nobody had ever seen. Any rock and roll in a in a musical show, mm -hmm. but the exciting and and the late great joseph papp do your theater history studies about the new york shakespeare festival mm -hmm. he did the same thing he's we were watching a a, a a really interesting documentary now recently and it was about that period of time in the 60s 
when oh, it was about Raul Julia, the the great late late Raul Julia. If you see it, watch it. But it talked about how he connected with Joseph Papp. Joe Papp took a trailer bed truck around the boroughs of New York City and perform Shakespeare on a street corner for nothing. They'd just show up and they'd open up the, the, the trailers and mm -hmm. have a small set. But you know Shakespeare, you can do it with nothing. You don't have to have a set. Mm -hmm. You just say the words and it tells you everything you want to know. Mm -hmm. Well, Joe Papp was the monster Shakespeare master. He loved Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. And for five years, he ran around the city of Detroit and Raul Julio was one of his first hires. That's where he did, did Shakespeare. Mm. And then he got city funding and helped that out. And then it eventually grew into this monster called the New York Shakespeare Festival, the mm -hmm. public theater. I'd love to see that kind of excitement here in Detroit with a show. Yeah. With a show. Somebody getting really... Remember, mm -hmm. you were here for Menopause the Musical? Oh, yeah. My, uh, you know, my wife worked the box office. She did. She did. Well, you know, the best thing about it was yeah. it was it was homegrown in Florida. They come up with a she came yeah. up with a good idea, expanded it. And then all of a sudden, for about five, six, seven years, she has companies all over the country making a million bucks. I and mean, it was great and employed mm -hmm. so many actors here in, in Detroit. Uh, older female. Actors, yeah, you which, bet. Which is great. Because it was they're, fabulous. Because that's a huge complaint, right, yeah. is that there's not a lot right. of roles for older female yep. actors, yep. or at and least there's. There wasn't at the time. I yeah, think that, I think it was great. And and at the time, I said, you know, that's what has to happen here in Detroit. We need a homegrown hit. I don't care if it's a crowd pleaser and entertaining. It should be crowd pleasing and entertaining. I'd also like it to shake people up and really shock them. Well, you but, know, I find that people are, you know, are really proud when there's when they have like a theater here that is real i mean like people brag on the purple well the purple rose did this yeah. and and that that is a huge you know a, a, a huge feather in the cap of that community and and but it's still like an hour and a half out from detroit and and people are very proud who know about their detroit rep are very proud of the detroit very proud of detroit public but <laughs> but it's interesting you that by and large, people don't know about it. If they knew about it, they would be proud. Same thing with marketing issues and putting yeah. out of all the cacophony of things that are going on mm -hmm. out there, how do you stand out? That's been a perplexing problem mm -hmm. since day one. I mean, how do you stand out and make new things? Yeah, I don't have the answer. I mean, even, even the thing with when they stopped, the free press stopped doing formal reviews of theater. I mean, that, that, was, that was a disgrace. How could they do that? Well, there, there's five people working there, Joe. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, they, they've, they don't have any reporters. I mean, people complain about like, oh, how the Detroit News doesn't cover theater anymore. They don't cover half the things that they, I mean, 90% of the stuff they used to cover. Right. There, I know people who work at the Detroit News. There's like five people there who are doing actual news. Yeah. Most of the news they get yeah. in, you know, yeah, that's, on, that's on the wire. A whole nother issue. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, they, they have to focus on, you know, the, the meat and potatoes and theater has never been it. Yeah. It's never been the meat and potatoes. It is, it is the gravy that makes the meat and potatoes yeah, it's taste certain. good. Can I quote you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, 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 uh, yeah. You can the have gravy. that. Uh, copyright Jeff Tamakis. Uh, <laughs> Twenty nineteen. Copyright Jeff Tamakis. But um, <laughs> but no, I, I you know it is it is something to think about and and. Uh, well, we're up yeah. against it in, in so many ways culturally. I mean, I, every time on Facebook that I see a post about, you know, uh, education and the arts should be in the schools. I don't have any children, so I never went through the period mm -hmm. when they started eliminating all the arts and music programs mm -hmm. out of the schools. But I would have been protesting at the... Uh, having, having taught it, I, I can tell you that, it, it, you know, my, my argument was always, you know, your math class, your science class you know, your English class, they all teach you the hard skills. The hard skills are important. You need to learn the hard skills. The hard skills are, are what you put on your resume, mm -hmm. right? But the theater is one of the few classes, if not the only class, that will teach you the soft skills, how to work as a group, how to, how to speak in front of others, how to be confident, how to, how to, how to be uh, you know, articulate in what you're saying, like when you're, you're speaking. And the soft skills are what get you the job. Well, and also when, when the kids discover technical theater, wow, well, that's where math comes in. It's where oh, all of the carpentry oh, yeah. and skills and algebra and what have you. Yeah. I mean, oh, I this... can't. Uh, if there's only one way to make kind of a, a, an arts kid swing a hammer, and that's putting them into tech. And that's really <laughs> important. They need to learn how to swing a hammer. That's right. 
Um, they will have a home at some point, and they will have to yeah. repair it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's it is proven over and over and over and over and yeah. over again how much how critical cult <clears throat> theater and the cultural arts are critical in education. It it just is, and you know I'm not going to get into politics and cutting back money and who mm. spends the money, who doesn't. It, it's just it's got to get. We just got to make it a priority. Yeah, it's got to be a priority. That's exactly you know. right. Exactly right. Well, I I hate to say this. But we've been speaking for about an hour, <laughs> and and it's and it's and we don't have any more time. We we've yeah, run out of time. You I have feel a like, lot more questions. You told me you were going to ask me about. My <laughs> yeah, there's so much more that I want to talk, and I hope that maybe we can do this again. I hope so too, man. Um, because this this conversation has been really great. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it at home. Um, we, we, yeah, on TV. Well, I thought we were in a we're, pod. We're, Aren't we doing a te- podcast? Te- technically, technically, we are on somebody's computer right now, probably. Oh, okay. uh, but um, well, listen, kids, I, I, I wore everything you're not supposed to do on TV. I, I wore a red shirt, <gasps> a sin, and then checkers. Oh. Yeah. Well, if you were listening in the podcast, nobody, yeah. nobody had to know. Well, so you yeah. could have kept that a secret. We could have been naked. For all <laughs> yeah, that. Well, yeah. well, maybe, maybe we are. <laughs> um, so if you if you like this video, please. Like it physically, click like, uh, hit, you know, uh, subscribe. If you have any questions or comments or if there's something that was said you, you really agree or disagree with, don't, don't forget to leave a comment. And uh, next week, um, I'm taking the week off. It's Thanksgiving. So we'll be back in two weeks with guests yet to be determined. But uh, I... Uh, no, no, we're we're, we're going to come back. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the Greek guy and the Finn. You know? The Greek, we're the Greek and the Finn. Yeah, the Greek Together and the Finn. Together again. <laughs> He's the battle-hardened veteran. He's the headstrong young rookie. Hello, everybody. Uh, so, I know that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you guys later.